the family feels that it's important for people to know that behind all of the media and behind all of the attention that they're that's being focused on on what's happened that there was a real person behind there and not only was she a real person she was an extremely special person so special the family bought her this bench in Queen Elizabeth Park close to her home and to her work so she could enjoy it before she left she was diagnosed with stomach cancer uh, three years ago mm -hmm. and at that time they decided to remove her stomach really and, uh, and again just to show you the kind of person she was um, she went through the uh, period of convalescing and then off she went around the world again to see her friends um, and of course she had special diet and a lot of her friends everywhere made sure that they uh, accommodated that diet and whatnot but she had to go and see them and and I think in many cases she went to say goodbye she told me maybe two three weeks ago that one of the things that that she regretted most about dying wasn't the fear of it but it was um, that she was leaving her friends and mm -hmm. her family and uh, that she was going to really miss that because they were such an important and big part of her life. Another essential part of her life was her students, mostly special needs. She started teaching blind students, then autistic, and for the last quarter century she taught here. But her family says she never brought her troubles home and was always up to the challenge. Well, one basic problem is that you have to be very flexible. You have children um, coming in all times of the day. You have visitors coming in. You have um, nurses, physicians, therapists, so and um, IV poles beeping. They have to get nursing staff. And so always there's um, lo lots of movement going in and out of the classroom. And you have you're, it's like teaching in a fishbowl, so to speak, often. <laughs> I can tell you her life was always devoted to other people. In fact, in my family, she was like a second mother to all of us. And the minute there was anything in our lives that caused us any discomfort, bang, she was there for us. And uh, every one of us. And, and in fact, this is the first crisis in my life that I've ever had to face without her. by a friend, 74-year-old Evelyn Martins arrives at the Duncan Courthouse for the first day of her B.C. Supreme Court trial. How are you feeling today? Very good, thank you. No comment. What does this trial this time mean to you, Evelyn? I'm sorry, I'm not commenting on anything. Martins is accused of two counts of aiding and abetting a person to commit suicide in connection with the deaths of 64-year-old Monique Charest, a former nun who died in Duncan in January 2002, and 52-year-old Leanne Birchall, a teacher who died in her Vancouver home in June 2002. Martins pleaded not guilty to both counts of assisting suicide in the deaths of the two women. She spent the rest of the day observing the proceedings from the gallery and making notes. Because the trial is proceeding without a jury for up to three weeks, there is a ban on the publication of any information heard by Justice Barry Davies at this stage. Mr. McKenzie, are you able to um, just comment on how serious the charges no, are? No, I'm afraid we can't make any comment at this point. Thank you. The reality of the situation is we don't want to make any public pronouncements in light of what's happened this morning. Like the Crown, defense lawyers Peter Firestone and Catherine Tyhurst are not commenting on the case. Jury selection is expected to begin in mid-October, when the voir dire portion of the trial is over. If convicted, Martins could face a maximum penalty of 14 years in prison. Up to a judge to decide whether you will be allowed to hear the details of a trial that could set a legal precedent. The case involves a Vancouver Island grandmother charged with helping two women commit suicide. But because of a sweeping publication ban, there's little we can report on what's happening inside a courtroom in Duncan. However, the ban is being challenged by CH News, BCPTV News on Global, and The Times Colonist. Evelyn Martins puts on a brave face, but this routine has to be a bit tiring, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. She shows up at a court in Duncan, and through the course of the day, she occasionally gets a chance to get outside and go for a drink or something to eat. On and off for the past two years, this has been something she's had to do. Would you like to make a comment? No, I'm sorry. Do you have any idea why they've uh, singled you out for this? No, I don't. No idea. How are you feeling today? Very good, thank you. No comment. For a woman who never sought out the spotlight, her court case on charges of aiding and abetting a suicide and counseling a suicide in two separate deaths has changed all that. 
This case being heard in the Duncan courtroom is unusual for a couple of reasons. One, it thrusts the right to die argument back into the public spotlight. And the second one is this order from the Supreme Court, which says that you cannot broadcast, distribute, or publish in any way what goes on in this court until after the jury reaches a verdict. CH News, BCTV on Global, and the Times Colonist newspaper don't agree with such a sweeping ban where the public is not allowed to find out what's happening through the course of the trial. An objection has been filed with the courts, which states in part, publication bans are an infringement of the charter, justified only where there is a risk to a fair trial. The court application goes on to say, the law of contempt already prevents publication of information which prejudices the trial. And it finishes by saying, the open court principle is not only to ensure that the public can know what is going on in Her Majesty's courts, but also to discuss, debate, and learn about the issues that arise. The media outlets have to wait for a response from the judge to know when they will get a chance to argue the case to let the public hear what the jury hears. A British Columbia woman accused of helping two other women take their own lives has been acquitted. Evelyn Martin says she can now move on with her life to find our client not guilty after uh, hearing Martin, the evidence. who was a member of the Right to Die so Society in Canada, was acquitted yesterday by a jury in Duncan, B.C. Lawyers for the 73-year-old woman argued that she was present only to provide comfort for the women and not to help them die. Two women killed themselves, but a Vancouver Island jury has found Evelyn Martin's not guilty in what could be a precedent-setting case. The story broke during our 6 o'clock newscast last night after 15 hours of deliberation. The 73-year-old was accused of helping a nun in Duncan and a teacher in Vancouver commit suicide. The assisted suicide advocate never denied being in the room when the women died, but insisted the claim that she gave the women drugs or suicide devices called exit bags was not true. Yeah. Very good, justified. Do you Very feel good. The, the evidence wasn't strong enough. Well, it's put my life on hold for two, year, two and a half years, so now I can start from day one, right? Advocates of assisted suicide hope the case can be used as a precedent to change Canadian law. After two days of deliberations, an elderly B.C. woman has been found not guilty of assisted suicide. Defense attorneys in the case argue that 73-year-old Evelyn Martins was with a pair of women when they died, but was only there for comfort. CTV's Todd Battis reports. Accused of having a hand in two suicides, 74-year-old Evelyn Martins headed into court knowing her own life was in the hands of a jury that would decide on two counts of aiding and abetting. Monique Charest, a former nun, was 64 when she was found dead in her apartment two years ago. Martins admitted to an undercover officer she was present when Charest died and hid evidence it was suicide. Six months later, under police watch, she attended the suicide of a 57-year-old Vancouver teacher. Leanne Birchall was dying of cancer. Crown prosecutors argued Martins went as far as to supply the women with suicide kits. Plastic bags and helium often used in assisted suicides to suffocate were found in her car and home. After two days, the jury found her innocent of all charges. The jury accepted, simply put, that it is not a criminal offense to simply being present when someone else commits uh, suicide. It's an important decision. It wasn't just Evelyn Martins on trial here, it was the law as well. In Canada, it's not illegal to commit suicide, but it is against the law for somebody to help another person take their life. Right to Life advocates hope the verdict would underline that. Now they fear it will encourage more assisted well, suicides. I think that uh, it's, a, it's a very serious thing if this case is used as a precedent to change the Canadian law. The case put the thorny issue back in public view. While Crown prosecutors consider whether to appeal, there's little doubt calls will come for changes to the 30-year law. Todd Battis, CTV News, Duncan, British Columbia. For more on this story now, we're joined by the family of Leanne Birchall, that her brother, Mark Birchall, and her sister, Denise Huguet. They are both in Vancouver. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, uh, Mark, maybe I can begin with you. Do you know Evelyn Martins? Have you met her before? Uh, we hadn't met her. Actually, we didn't even know anything about Evelyn Martins until uh, the day my sister died. But w since then, we've met her at the uh, preliminary hearing and uh, at the hearing. And uh, actually, we've grown quite fond of her. Oh, and that's what I wanted to ask you. What was your reaction to the verdict? <coughs> Our family is absolutely elated about the verdict. Evelyn Martins is a very warm and compassionate uh, human being. And she shouldn't have, uh, frankly, she shouldn't have been on trial. And 
she shouldn't have been persecuted the way she has been for the last two and a half years. Denise, tell us, I mean, why? I mean, why, why, are, why is your family elated by this decision? Um, because um, there was no crime, as far as we're concerned. Leanne took her life um, when uh, she felt that the quality of her life was over, and uh, Leanne, uh, Leanne died of an overdose of drugs. So, uh, as far as we're concerned, um, it was Leanne's choice. And um, if Evelyn Martins was there, then she was there to give Leanne comfort uh, during her final moments when we couldn't be there with her. Mark, it's so intrusive. I mean, you know, here we are talking to you about this. It's almost like the whole nation has all of a sudden descended on your family and, and uh, you know, and people then pass judgment. And uh, we really have no sense of what her life was like at that time. Maybe you can tell us. <laughs> what Leanne's life was like when she died? Yeah. Well, Leanne really didn't have much of a life. By the time she died, she uh, she was always a very active person. She loved life. She was, uh, I mean, just she just incredibly embraced life uh, to the fullest. And by the time she died, she had deteriorated to 75 pounds. She was in severe pain, which they couldn't control. And uh, she had no life left, really. Uh, she was trying to cram in as much as she could with, with her friends and uh, and their family, but um, at the end, she was just waiting to die. Mark, I have to ask you, lastly, I mean, in that story that we just heard from Todd Battis, there was a member of the Right to Life Association saying, you know, they're concerned about this decision, that it could lead to further assisted suicides in this country. Um, I, want, I want your family's reaction to that. Well, assisted suicides, uh, uh, let me uh, forget assisted suicides for a minute, but, uh, you know, when people are terminally ill and in severe pain, um, people are, are taking their lives all the time because they have no choice. What we believe is that the government needs to uh, regulate this and, and give people a legal option so that they don't have to resort to putting a gun in their mouth or jumping off a bridge when they, when they uh, have no other options left to them. We believe that if, if the government would regulate this and, and put in place some sort of doctor-assisted suic doctor suicide, then it could be controlled rather than leaving desperate people to take desperate action. Uh, a difficult situation for you both, and we appreciate you both talking with us about this. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank More you. tonight on the controversial case involving a 73-year-old grandmother found not guilty of helping two B.C. women commit suicide. Evelyn Martins says she was merely present during the suicides to provide comfort. Now the family of one of the women is speaking out about the difficult decisions faced by people considering the right to die. The right to die, the right to life, the right to choose. A jury of 12 people has found 73-year-old great-grandmother Evelyn Martins not guilty of assisting in the suicides of two sick BC women in 2002. The Euthanasia Prevention Coalition is appalled. We're very disappointed in the decision. We followed the whole case, and um, you know, I, I don't know. I was, I'm just in shock. I guess you could say. Martin's admitted attending the suicides of 64-year-old former nun Monique Charest and 57-year-old former teacher Leanne Birchall, but she denied any direct involvement in their deaths, saying she was only present to provide comfort and compassion. Birchall's family is relieved Martin's was found not guilty. When the verdict actually came down, what was your initial reaction? I cried because I was so relieved for Evelyn because we don't believe that Evelyn committed any crimes. Be because we weren't there, we don't know what happened. We only know what we heard in testimony and in court. But we also weren't there when Leanne died and we feel robbed because we should have been able to be there to give her our love and comfort in her final moments on earth. Leanne's 84-year-old mother Barbara says her daughter fought stomach cancer courageously for three long years. She made mostly all her own choices and, and she used to say that um, when the quality of life was missing then, uh, then you might just as well be gone. Over the three years from her stomach being removed to the time she died, she went from being a voluptuous, beautiful woman to a 75-pound skeleton. She was gradually starving to death. And 
towards the end they were unable to control her pain and uh, the morphine didn't have the same effect as when it started and uh, so the only means she had to control her pain was a piping hot water bottle which she kept on her abdomen constantly and uh, we discovered that because of the heat of the hot water bottle it was cooking her flesh which is horrifying to think of but it was the only thing that controlled her pain the euthanasia prevention coalition wants crown counsel to appeal the martin's verdict meanwhile leanne birchall's family is hoping the ruling helps trigger changes in the law i don't believe that a person who's depressed should have suicide as an option but i think somebody who's terminally ill and they're going to die anyways if it's to save themselves some pain then they should have that option Tonight, the first one was discovered on Vancouver Island. She seemed to have gone peacefully, but the RCMP were suspicious. There must be something here. It's not just smoke. There must be a, there must be a fire here somewhere. Another lived in Vancouver and slipped away right under the noses of watching police. What do you do? We wait till they're really dead, till we know that they're for sure that they're gone. And then we turn the tank off. A third threw herself a noisy farewell party, then turned to this man to help her go. And somebody has to be there to pray with them and hold their hands so that they don't raise that bag. Does that make sense? Three suspicious deaths, all connected to this Canadian woman and to an international movement dedicated to giving death a hand. Hello, I'm Hannah Gartner. Welcome to the Fifth Estate. Tonight, questions of living, of dying, and of choosing how and when to go. Traditionally, the human lifespan was said to be the biblical three score years and ten, 70 years. These days, most of us hope to live a lot longer than that. But what if you know you aren't going to make it even that far? What if you're facing a painful early end? What if you want to pick your own time? It was those questions one unassuming Canadian grandmother set out to answer. She was at the heart of a worldwide network, the target of an international police investigation, and the lead player in a troubling yet amazing story about giving death a hand. Ireland is blessed with beauty, and the Irish have a blessing for everything. There's one that goes, may you live as long as you want and never want as long as you live. Everyone who was in the hotel bar in Westport County Mayo that night three years ago would have said amen to that. It was one heck of a party. Among the patrons, a Dublin woman, 48-year-old Rosemary Toole, and two American men, one of them, Unitarian Minister George Exo. About 10 o'clock, all these dancers came in. I mean, it wasn't anything we knew about. They just all arrived, these wonderful Irish dancers. And um, so they started doing their reeling and jigging, and, and, uh, and then they wanted, they said, oh, Father, come up and sing a song for us, you know. <laughs> The Irish folk band and the whiskey lasted well into the night. The next day, Rosemary Toole and the two Americans checked out of the hotel and by nightfall, they were in Dublin. The mystery of what happened to Rosemary Toole began where their celebration and their journey ended, in a rented townhouse in an upscale part of Dublin. The next day, the Americans were gone, a body was discovered, and police were notified. In charge was Superintendent Kieran Kenny. Some of our people went to the scene, and when they entered the house, they found the body of a female in an upstairs bedroom uh, lying on a bed. And the circumstances they saw in the room 
from their own knowledge led them to be suspicious but the actual investigation itself was conducted exactly the same way that a murder investigation would take place here. Looking for clues, police went through the house. Letters, emails and receipts kept turning up one name. Someone living in Canada. That's when Irish police called the RCMP. And that triggered an investigation into an international network that was giving death a hand. As it turned out, the RCMP were already investigating a suspicious death of their own. It was in Duncan, British Columbia, a featured spot on a lot of tourist maps of Vancouver Island. This quiet little town was suddenly the center of a major criminal investigation. Late one afternoon, police and ambulance crews had been called to the second floor apartment where a 64-year-old woman lived alone with her cat. When the superintendent let them in, they found everything was immaculate. There was nothing out of place, except sitting in the living room was Monique Chade. She was dead. At first glance, it appeared to be a natural death. But when they searched her papers, they came up with the same name Irish police had found. When we had that come to us, then we knew that there must be something here. It's not just smoke. There must be a there must be a fire here somewhere. Sergeant Derek Crawford is retired now, but he was in charge of this case. Two women, half a world apart, yet connected in death to a name, a woman's name. This was big. So you figured she had a lot of dead bodies in her wake. We didn't know. That's what we were trying to find out. We had found that there, she was connected to two of these, and we wanted to know. Uh, was there more to it and exactly how how was she uh, connected to them tracing the suspect's name to an address just outside Victoria Crawford ordered undercover surveillance of her house when things began to heat up by June 2002 Crawford shifted the operation into high gear one morning just after seven their suspect climbed into a red van and headed east into Victoria. Right behind her were two unmarked police cars. They knew exactly where she was going. To meet an undercover officer posing as the dead woman's godchild, Sergeant Crawford had ordered the sting. Without going into any detail, basically the uh, operator uh, arranged to have a meeting with her around Victoria and uh, could they get together because she wanted to discuss uh, her uh, godmother's last uh, last hours or last days on earth kind of thing. So you're going to do it in a hotel room initially, right? Probably, yes. And you're going to bug the hotel room? Yes. Crawford's plan began to unravel right from the get-go. Instead of keeping that appointment with the undercover cop in Victoria, the suspect boarded the ferry bound for Vancouver. Having no idea where she might be headed, all police could do was follow her. The suspect still had no clue that she was being set up by police. In fact, she called the undercover cop saying something had come up and could she reschedule the meeting for later that afternoon in Vancouver. Police were determined not to lose her as she hit the highway into the city. She led them to a quiet residential area in Vancouver's North End, then disappeared into one of the homes. Crawford's team waited outside the house. An hour later, the suspect finally made her way to a nearby coffee shop and that meeting with the cop she believed was the godchild of the deceased Monique Chere. And we were able to, uh, to observe that meeting and we were able to uh, record the conversation that took place during that uh, almost hour long meeting. What you're seeing is a reenactment 
But what you will hear is the actual conversation secretly taped by the undercover cop. I, I, I really don't know where to start. How did you, uh, how did you ever meet Monique? She's my godmother. Yeah, but I mean... Uh, well, obviously through my mother. Yeah, and and the family. That's right. And uh, her, her and my mother um, went to school together. Um, and in, in fact, I think... My mom doesn't talk about it a lot. And I, After listening I, for an hour, police happened. felt satisfied they had the incriminating evidence they needed. But something was gnawing at Sergeant Crawford as he watched from across the street. He kept replaying the day's events in his mind. What possibly uh, had we uh, discovered? What, what have we po possibly missed? Then it hit him like a ton of bricks. This suspect, connected to two suspicious deaths, had been out of their sight in that house for a whole hour. One of the investigators uh, suggested, well, maybe there's a dead person at that residence. Maybe something like that happened, and maybe that, that will have to be checked out. The light bulb uh, went off. Yeah, or at least it started to, to come on that, you know, maybe there's a, something more here, and we'd better get this checked out. They immediately alerted Vancouver police to go to the house of 57-year-old Leanne Burchill. Mark Burchill and Denise Huguet are Leanne's brother and sister. Denise recalls the scene when she arrived home that summer day three years ago. We pulled up in front of the house and the house was crawling with police. The police were coming in and out of the front door and they were all over the front yard and I, I, I just didn't know what. I thought we'd been robbed. I didn't, I didn't know what was going on so I jumped out of the car and I said, what are you all doing in our house? And a policeman came up to me and asked who I was and all the rest of it. And he said, uh, your sister lives upstairs. And I said, yes. And he said, I regret to inform you, your sister is deceased. Vancouver police then took her downtown for questioning. You know, you, you get caught up with, why are they asking me these questions? Because I had so many questions myself that I wanted to know. And all of a sudden, it, I realized that he's asking me questions like, uh, as if I had something to do with this. Because I said to him, are, are, are you, do you think I had something to do with this? Do you think I did it? This is an important safety announcement. Ship personnel are certified by Transport Canada to deal with emergency situations. The cop from Duncan knew the sister didn't do it. And he had a pretty good idea where he could find the real suspect. And he knew he had her cornered. She was back in Victoria about to get off the ferry. Believing he could directly connect her to suspicious deaths, he decided it was time to move in. Stand down, don't forget to pick up your books, put your cards back in, and hand in your keys. And so we contacted the Sydney RCMP, which is at the uh, ferry terminal uh, near Victoria, and uh, directed that they seize the vehicle and its contents. Prosecutors and police believe they have a pretty solid case. After all, they have a suspect they're able to place at the scene of not one, but two deaths. Plus, they have all kinds of physical evidence. The killing tools they confiscated from the suspect's vehicle and house. With all of this, you'd think that it would be an open and shut case. Well, it's not so simple. When we come back, a 72-year-old grandmother on a mission. How many deaths have you witnessed? Oh, I'd rather not say. I can't tell you that. As the passenger ferry made its way into Victoria Harbor, the RCMP was waiting. With two bodies in British Columbia and a connection to another one in Ireland, their six-month investigation was about to come to an end. Police believe they had in their clutches the head of an international underground movement. After waving the other cars off the ferry, police closed in. It turned out their kingpin was a little old lady, 72-year-old grandmother Evelyn Martins. When the ferry docked in Victoria, I was, my, my van was held back. I thought, oh, I know I'm in trouble. What have I done? Why did I do this? And uh, two RCP officers were waiting outside the gates for me and they pulled me over. And uh, 
one of the RCP officers said that uh, I was under arrest for uh, assisting a suicide. While suicide is legal in Canada, helping someone else kill themselves is against the law. Would you like to make a comment? No, I'm sorry. Evelyn Martins was charged with assisting not one but two suicides, the one in Duncan and the other in Vancouver. She faced a maximum penalty of 28 years in prison. How many years have you been attending suicides? How many years have I been attending suicides? Maybe about five. How many deaths have you witnessed? Oh, I'd rather not say. I can't tell you that. It's something I felt I had to do. But it's perspective, you know. Some people would say you are a, a death provider. No, I don't, I don't feel I am. I'm a, de I'm a comforter. What do you get out of it, personally? Personally, the fact that I've helped someone just by being there. I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a very caring person and it, it matters to me that people should have the death that they want and shouldn't have to die alone. It's lonely to die alone. Of Martin's six children, Mark, the middle son, had the most difficult time accepting his mother's calling. It was a real shock, it was. And, uh, and then especially when she said, that, you know, she's been charged with counts of assisted suicide. And it's like, whoa, you know, like I, I had no idea that she was even involved in that. As a Christian, I believe, you know, God chooses when we enter this world. And I think oh, she should also choose when we leave, you know. And I, I think people are taking um, his responsibility into their own hands. You know, people are are becoming like God and, and making all these decisions. Evelyn Martins came to her convictions about death and dying in a very personal way. The depression was just beginning when she was born in Swift Current, Saskatchewan. It was a hard scrabble life and things only got worse when six years later her father died leaving her family penniless. Evelyn was always trying to help out the best she could. Her brothers and sisters called her Goody Two-Shoes. When she was 15, Martins left school to wait on table so she could help support the family. Her first husband died, leaving her with a young daughter, Millie. Her next marriage was to Ed Polzer. He worked the railways and liked to box. That marriage lasted more than 20 years. It brought five more children and a lot of pain. Okay, that's me back there in the back, and then Mark and Bart, and this is Bernie. She always had the long blonde hair. And Millie, you had long blonde hair too. You were cute. Somebody's birthday? There's Orange Pop. It's gonna be a birthday. Yeah. We had Orange Pop and hot dogs on birthdays. Leslie, Millie, and Ed don't have too many fond childhood memories to share. Their life was dominated by a sometimes abusive man. One of our birthday treats. Uh, <laughs> people got, when, when, normal people got the bumps. We got to lick them. Yeah, the old man, if you were 10 years old, you get... 10. 10. And if you were 11, you got 11. So Millie would hide in the basement. And... Uh, well, it wasn't fun on birthdays yeah, when yeah. Dad was home. Yeah. He thought we were having a good time as well. He is sick. It all took a huge toll on Evelyn Martins, and the stress of staying in such a difficult marriage brought her just about to the breaking point. I thought she had a nervous breakdown one time in Jasper, didn't she? I don't know if you call it a nervous breakdown, but it was it was really bad. It was to the point where. I think she wanted to, th she was thinking about suicide, but she figured, what's going to happen to my kids if I do? And I, I honestly think that's the only thing that stopped her, is the kids. Yeah, we were pretty close together, uh, the kids. It was like uh, She's all, of us, that held uh, us together. all of us against him. Yes. That's how it was. Martins did finally take the children and leave her husband, who has since died. But the most painful lesson Evelyn Martins learned was from her older brother, Cornelius. Theirs was a particularly close relationship. The whole family was devastated when, at 58, Cornelius was diagnosed with cancer. 
He died two and a half years later. And he suffered unnecessarily. We couldn't touch him anywhere. And he would he'd be in, slip in and out, but he was in great pain. And you could touch his body anywhere and he would scream. I and mean, then it was a bad death. It was horrible. He suffered, you suffered. Yes. Is it fair to say that that made a crusader out of you? Yes, yes. Had I known what I knew, not what I knew now, I would have uh, helped my brother. I would have given him the information he needed. And I'm sure that he would have done it himself. Evelyn Martins learned a lot about helping people end their lives when she joined a grassroots organization that had started up in Victoria, B.C. in 1991. It's called the Right to Die Society, and today it has some 400 members across the country. The organization offers some practical advice on how to kill yourself. It also lobbies to legalize euthanasia and assisted suicide. Evelyn Martins joined because she wanted to help others die with more dignity than her brother had. I talked to Eddie, my oldest son, and I asked him what he thought of, of what I was intending to do, you know, and he said, well, Mom, you, you have convictions, and if you don't have the courage of your convictions, what good are they? I mean, that's false. It's, it's phony if you don't follow through. Yeah, she got these olive bulbs from Brenda. Brenda Hand. How long, about four or five years ago? Yeah, at least, yeah. Martin's sister, Gwen, and Martin's daughter, Bernie, recall yeah. how she rose to become the Right to Die Society's director of membership, communicating with people all over the world. She was on the phone all the time. I'd come home from uh, from from work at lunch, and like I'm noisy with the dogs, and every time she'd be on the phone at lunch, quiet, quiet, I'm on the phone. She'd have to run to her bedroom and into her office, and because she was just that's the way she was. Just she's counseling for yeah. telling me how but life can be beautiful. Yeah. She wasn't counseling to to commit suicide. No. She just let them know that there's help out there. But once that decision to die was made, Evelyn Martins was able to provide the most effective and painless killing apparatus, something she herself had helped to perfect. It's called an exit bag. It's really just a clear plastic bag you put over your head. It's got this collar with a hose attachment, and it connects to a helium tank, the kind you can buy at any children's party store. What happens is the helium tricks the mind into thinking that you're still breathing oxygen so you don't feel you're suffocating. And without oxygen, you're dead in a matter of minutes. And these exit bags and how-to information was distributed internationally? Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. But this was a product and information that you sold? Mm -hmm. We covered our costs. We had to cover our costs. How much demand was there for, for the exit bags, for the, the how-to literature? A great demand. A great demand. I mean, how would you characterize this, the, the, the demand? You mean how many did we uh, mm. send out? Oh, sometimes a hundred at a time. So this became a business? Mm -hmm. But we never re really recovered all our costs. There's something macabre about the whole notion of an exit bag? It really isn't. It, you know, if you if you witnessed a, a death uh, by the, with the helium method, you know it isn't macabre, it's peaceful. It was the way 57-year-old Leanne Birchall chose to go. She's the one who died while police waited for Martins outside her house. Very vibrant educated and intelligent woman, uh, a nice person. Uh, she called quite often, we talked quite often. I went over to visit her and I could clearly see that she was very emaciated. She was in the final stages of cancer. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you, you make these, you make these chats that you have with these people sound casual, cozy, as if they're making inquiries about buying a bed sofa or something. <laughs> it's, this not is like, it's not like that at all. It's not like that at all. It's just a reasoned discussion between two people. And I always encourage people to consider all their options, but Leanne had already done that. 
Leanne Birchall was a teacher who loved life and traveled the world. She had done it all on her own terms, and she did not want to wait for stomach cancer to kill her. Her siblings, Mark Birchall and Denise Huguet, understood that. The morphine quit working as a, as a painkiller for her, or it wasn't sufficient. So she would fill hot water bottles, scalding, scalding hot water out of the kettle, put it right on her bare skin. And her sk all across here was black, and all across her back, cooked. black. And she smelled like cooked meat. The woman who had once been so fiercely independent was now begging for help to die. I think she asked our doctor. I think she asked the pharmacist. I think she asked everybody. And everybody was like, sorry, you know, because how can anybody help her? She asked me. And right at the early stages, and I said, I just, I just can't. I can't uh, put my life and the life of my family in jeopardy. And it was heartbreaking because really I would like to have... You know, you ask yourself, how, how committed are you to this person? And when they ultimately need you, and you can't help them, you know, it's... It's hard. In the end, she turned to Evelyn Martins, for which her family is grateful. We weren't able to be there in Leanne's final moments, and we were glad that somebody was, because we hated the thought of her dying alone. But over in Duncan on Vancouver Island, nobody is thanking Evelyn Martins for helping Monique Chade end her life. The 64-year-old woman had an inherited blood disease and she was in constant pain, but she was not terminally ill. She was a former nun, a uh, very um, precise little woman, warm-hearted, really warm-hearted, smiling, but in pain, and she knew what she wanted. And why did she want to die? Because of her pain. She was so afraid of yeah, having another stroke. She'd had one. And I think this is a fear of many people, having stroke and ending up in a, in a immobile with an active mind in a body that's not working. So she died peacefully? Very peacefully. Then what do you do? We wait till they're really dead. Till we know that they're for sure that they're gone. And then we turn the tank off and we took the bags with us, the bag and the helium tanks with us. N not, not to tidy up but to get your fingerprints off of everything. Well, and to tidy up, yes, and to get your fingerprints off of things. Really? Well, my, you know, the only place my fingerprints were was on the, the tank because you're shutting it off. Because as the population it was not cut and dried for retired Sergeant Derek Crawford, who headed the investigation into both deaths. Two cases that superficially looked the same, but were so very different. Uh, one person was uh, suffering dreadfully and uh, had a terminal disease that was going to claim them shortly anyway, whereas the other one appeared to be a relatively healthy, active woman that uh, shouldn't have died. Do you still believe that a crime was committed? Well, definitely. Evelyn Martins was on a crusade. If someone somewhere was suffering so much they wanted to end their life, she would help them die. Canadian police began to understand the scope of Martins' mission when a woman turned up dead thousands of miles away on the other side of the Atlantic. When we come back, praying for death. You are, you're a death chaplain, in fact. Well, I'm kind of a midwife to the dying. Yeah, I guess. The chain of events that began here in the resort town of Westport County, Mayo, on the west coast of Ireland, would affect the life of a woman thousands of kilometers away in Victoria, British Columbia. Music and laughter were pouring out of the hotel bar that night in January 2002. 
In the midst of all the revelry were two American men and an Irish woman, 48-year-old Rosemary Toole. It was her going away party. Rosemary Toole planned to be dead within 24 hours, but no one who was at this bar that night had the slightest idea. What they saw looked like a celebration as the Irish folk band played and the Jack Daniels flowed. Rosemary Toole spent her last night on earth talking and laughing the night away with her two companions. The hour will come when you shall worship God. One of the people with her that night was a Unitarian minister from Beckley, West Virginia, Reverend George Exo. You are our father and our mother and we are your children. His flock is small because no bricks and mortar church will give him a pulpit all because he heads Compassionate Chaplaincy, a service that has helped more than 100 people commit suicide. You are, you're a death chaplain, in fact. Well, I'm kind of a midwife to the dying. Yeah, I guess, yeah, Interesting sure. concept, a midwife yeah, to the dying. Yeah, you know, I, I enable a process. I guide a process. That's exactly what Rosemary Toole wanted. This was a woman who was not terminally ill, but terribly depressed. She had tried to kill herself before and did not want to fail again, so she paid Exo and his partner to fly to Ireland all the way from West Virginia. Rosemary Tool planned absolutely everything about her death, including that big send-off. Wasn't that wonderful? Wasn't that wo I think that was absolutely great. When she was having so much fun, did you think maybe she didn't really want to die? Did you try to talk her out of it? Say, okay, two of you, Rosemary, you want to go through with this? I sure did, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, you know, so that was, uh, that idea had been checked out several times uh, during the course of my stay. What was she saying to you that made you feel in your heart, okay, this is something she really wants? Well, I knew that she had made an, many attempts to find somebody, you know, so it wasn't just, uh, I wasn't, the f I knew she, I wasn't the first person who had talked, she had talked to. Rosemary Toole was very determined. She had everything prepared down to the last detail. She was dressed in this gold lame gown. You know, she had brought this very special gown with her that, that she wanted to use at the end and, and uh, be dressed in. And she had four large helium tanks. She four large helium tanks. Well, one of those helium tanks I can get to run for 50 minutes, you know. She <laughs> and she had hundreds of pills, hundreds of them. So, I mean, she came equipped. She could have, we, we could have taken out five or six people easily. But even if someone does go overboard the way Rosemary Toole did, Exo says you really still do need someone there who knows what they're doing. If the person uh, tries to lift the bag, they won't be aware of it, but they may try to raise that bag uh, as an unconscious act, and somebody has to be there to pray with them and hold their hands so that they don't raise that bag. Does that make sense? Pull the bag down back over their head? No, you just hold their hands so they can't raise it up. We're I praying with you, I okay? See. George Exo wasn't the first person Rosemary Toole contacted. He was her last stop in a very long journey that began with the Right to Die Society of Canada and Evelyn Martins. I got an email from Evelyn Martin in Canada saying that she had a communication from Rosemary saying, was there anybody who could help her to die? Martins referred Rosemary to retired family physician Libby Wilson in Glasgow, Scotland. She heads a group called Friends at the End. But Dr. Wilson believes only those who are terminally ill should be helped to die. Rosemary didn't qualify. So when Rosemary got in touch with me, she said, would I go to Dublin and help her to die? And I said, no way. In any case, it was against the law. And uh, I wasn't prepared to break the law on anybody's behalf, but it was primarily because I felt that she hadn't explored all the options. How, how did she sound to you? Was she depressed? No. No, she didn't sound depressed. She sounded obsessed. She's not the same thing, you know. She was absolutely dead set on taking her own life. I mean, you know, people who have these kind of mental illnesses, they do want to attract attention. They do want to make a fuss about things. 
because after all, Rosemary could have jumped off a high building, but she didn't, you see. No one was going to talk Rosemary Toole out of killing herself. She tried another name Evelyn Martins had given her, George Exo. She was pretty adamant. It was, it was a celebration for her. She was getting, I was the answer to her prayers. I was Santa Claus coming through the door here with my bag of goodies. I'm doing something that these people really want. And then if I get signals confirming that they have uh, reached the other side, you know, okay, I know it's been a good event for Did me. Rosemary send you a signal? Yes, she did. She said, I'm going to send you the signal of roses, George, because Rosa, you know, I was named after the flower, the rose. Now, the next night we're in Amsterdam and walking along the street and all of a sudden a man brushes by us carrying over his shoulder what must have been six dozen maybe more ten dozen red roses over his shoulder I have never seen that before I have never seen it since is this not just a way to give yourself absolution Reverend no no I don't think so EXO is not planning another trip to Ireland anytime soon He's a wanted man there. Ireland has demanded that the United States extradite him so he can stand trial for Rosemary Toole's death. Ireland says you are a criminal. You participated uh, in a suicide. This is aiding, abetting. They want you to, this is a felony yes. that could get you 14 years yes. in jail, so, and they want you to stand trial. So, so, so I ask the question then, of what possible interest can it be to people in Ireland, or to the government in Ireland, to have Rosemary Toole suffer. Rosemary Toole was buried in a cemetery outside Dublin on February 2nd, 2002. She had discovered that if you really want to kill yourself, there is an international network of suicide groups willing to help. The referral she got to Dr. Wilson in Scotland and Reverend Exo in the U.S came from the Canadian Evelyn Martins. She even sold her an exit bag, hoping she wouldn't use it. She seemed to me to be depressed, and, and I, you know, and that's not a very good reason to die. In my opinion, it isn't. You have to look for a cure for that, try and deal with it. And I, I asked her to deal with it as well. But you sold her an exit bag. Hey, an exit bag doesn't know, is no good by itself. But it's like... If she wants to die, and you say go and seek help and get out of your depression by selling her an exit bag, aren't you sort of pushing her a little closer to the exit? No, I don't think so, because she, she would have made her own. She would have done it herself. But on the one hand, you suggest maybe this is an abuse. On the other hand, you say if a depressed person really wants to die, that is their right to do, and if they seek help, they should get it. Well, I don't think they'd get the help if they were only... Holding. Rosemary Toole did. Well, yes, she did. The same sorts of questions came up at Evelyn Martin's trial in British Columbia. She was looking at a maximum of 28 years for assisting in the deaths of two women, Leanne Burchill and Monique Chere. The case against Evelyn Martin's takes three weeks. Prosecutors called dozens of witnesses trying to prove that Martins not only supplied the equipment delivering death, but that she was also an active participant in two suicides. Martins answers none of these accusations. She makes no statement. She doesn't even take the stand in her own defense. The prosecuting attorneys thought they had the one piece of evidence that would put Martins away for sure. You remember the undercover cop posing as the godchild of Monique Shere, the 64-year-old woman from Duncan, B.C.? Well, she had secretly taped the conversation with Martins. So, the, the morphine, did she inject it, or just, uh, is it pills? Yeah. Okay. Um, a little bit of alcohol, but uh, she had some, some wine. Alcohol, a oh, wine. That exacerbates the effect of the pills, so it works faster. And didn't make her sick or throw up, or what I would that would Coming up is perhaps the most incriminating section. Is she suggesting she might have actively helped Monique Chere? Okay. She didn't want to be alone. She didn't want to wake up and still be here. And that's where I came in. When this tape was played in court, 
Some felt compassion. Others heard a confession. Evelyn Martins did not deny she was there. But in the end, the jury accepted her lawyer's argument that Martins did not actively help the women die. Oh, you're not helping. You're, you're comforting them while they do die. There's a difference. It's a semantic difference. Mm -hmm. While you argue that um, assisted suicide is not always wrong, is it possible that it's not always right? Absolutely. There could be a lot of abuses. It's not, it's not governed. There's no, there aren't any laws. To, there's no, uh, no one's looking after it. But in the end, it's, a, it's subjective. You decide who you are going to help. You decide who you are not going to help die. I guess. Should it be so? No. No, it shouldn't be so. There should be safeguards in place. Very excellent book, you're right. And I must admit, I mean, that all happened... There were celebrations when Evelyn Martins was found not guilty. But many still question the whole idea of assisted suicide. Martins no longer attends deaths. She's afraid police are still watching her. In our story, we reported on three women who chose death. One terminally ill, one in chronic pain, and one desperately unhappy. All were supplied with the know-how and the means, if not a helping hand. What do you think about the three cases we've outlined, and more broadly, about the whole idea of assisted suicide? We'd very much like to hear from you, and you can share your views with us at cbc.ca slash fifth. We're going to be right back with more of the Fifth Estate. Those stories coming soon here on the Fifth Estate. For now and for everyone here at the Fifth Estate, I am Hannah Gartner. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.